Awards. Uh, we thank you a lot for coming to this uh, virtual literature review on gender-based violence during fieldwork uh, that's organized uh, by the Women Doing Fieldwork Network and Ariana Markovitz, one of its members. Um, this is a collective decolonial feminist and participatory space enriched by the diversity of our members. The network is formed with the aim to promote the security, safety, well-being, and rights of academic women. This is in recognition that women's role in science is a vital pillar for building an inclusive and just world. Um, the founders of the network are um, my colleague, Dr. Ana Laura Zavala Guillén. Uh, she is a human uh, rights lawyer with a PhD in human geography with expertise in fieldwork in conflict and post-conflict areas and participatory research methods. She is now a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the School of Geography at Queen Mary University in London. Uh, Jennifer Venstra is an environmental soil scientist specializing in sustainability and human soil relations with a focus in Europe and Latin America. She's a PhD candidate in physical geography at the Department of Geography at the University of Sheffield. And I am a human geographer specializing in the implementation of solidarity, solidarity, solidarity practices in indigenous communities with touristic driven economies as an alternative to development. And I am a PhD candidate in human geography at the Department of Geography also at the University of Sheffield. And Ariana Markovitz, which is a co-organizer of this event and will chair uh, the discussion, is a social urbanist and feminist researcher specializing in urban violence, participatory design, and research ethics with more than 15 years of cross-sector experience in 15 countries. And she is a PhD candidate in development planet at the Bartlett at UCL. Uh, like uh, we said, this is a collaborative project. We invite you to contribute uh, to, uh, to collect and review literature on violence that women researchers experience during data collection. A comprehensive review of this scholarship will allow us to identify its ga gaps, informs our research methods and fieldwork strategies and advocate for changes in institutional policies and protocols. This first event is one of, of for, is one of our, uh, is one of our of a four part series. The remaining of three events will take place on June and September and November. If you would like to present a piece of literature at one of these events, uh, which can be your own and can be in progress, please send an expression of interest to Ariana, including the work you would like to present and in which that date you would like to participate. Uh, we are also building a shared public bibli bibliography of literature that engages directly or indirectly with violence that women researchers experience uh, while collecting data, which is available at Sotero. And to contribute, uh, join us, uh, join the network by subscribing at, at that uh, GISC mail. Uh, and well, just, just to clarify the group agreements, it's you have to respect in diversity, listen first, talk later, and it's okay to disagree, just don't be disagreeable. Uh, during the presentations and Q&A, please uh, mute your microphone. Uh, during the discussions and Q&A, to ask a question to the speakers, raise your hand and go live or write your question to everyone in the chat. And what happens in the meeting stays in the meeting and let's create a safe space for everyone. Uh, this session will be recorded, so if you do not wish to be recorded, please keep your camera and microphone switched off. Participants are also free to rename themselves in the session if they prefer to remain completely anonymous. And we will finalize uh, the future public access arrangement for the recording after the event takes place, and we will send you details via email. And enjoy. So I'll leave you now with Ariana. Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to meet you. I'm Ariana. Thank you very much for coming. Um, it's kind of amazing that there are so many people here. Um, so, and also happy Women's Day to all of you, um, whatever gender you identify as, but it's exciting that we're all here um, supporting each other's liberation. <laughs> um, 
So I'm going to, um, the way that this is going to work is that uh, there are going to be uh, two speakers, um, each presenting work that they themselves have written. Um, we're excited to put these two into conversation. One of them is a bit more of kind of an intro to this topic that we're working with. And then the other one is um, more specific, an autoethnography about her own experience. Um, so uh, I'm going to introduce Erin um, first. Um, she's going to be uh, the second speaker uh, and then Mindy and then Mindy will go into her presentation. Um, so, um, so Dr. Erin Pritchard um, is a lecturer in disability studies at Liverpool Hope University here in the UK, um, which is where I am as well. Uh, and she's a core member of the Center for Cultural Disability Studies. Uh, her main research areas focus on disability access and stereotypes, and she's also interested in dwarfism and sexuality and issues of researcher safety. Um, her most recent publication, a book entitled Dwarfism, Spatiality and Disability Experiences, focuses on the social and spatial experiences of people with dwarfism in public spaces, which sounds spectacularly interesting and I'm really excited to read it. <laughs> um, so, and then um, Dr. Mindy Schneider is a development sociologist and assistant professor at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, um, specializing in global food politics, agro-food complexes and regimes, political ecology and historical sociology. So she's currently working on three interrelated research areas. The first one is the social and ecological transformations that accompany the industrialization and capitalization of China's agro-food system. The second is around waste and wasting alongside death and dying. And the third one is the role of rural natures and peoples in the history of capitalist development. So connected to this final area of research, Mindy is also the senior editor of the new open access journal, Commodity Frontiers, which is part of a larger initiative of the same name, which she co-leads. So hi, Erin. Hi, Mindy. <laughs> um, thank you both for joining us. Um, both of you have about 10 to 15 minutes to present. Um, feel free, everybody else, to post your questions in the chat, um, and we will deal with the questions all together in a larger discussion when the presentations are finished. So, um, Mindy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, um, Ariana, and uh, everyone in the network, really, for in inviting me to join, but also for starting the initiative and having this fantastic idea for a live literature review. I think it's so wonderful and I'm really um, very happy to be a part of it. Um, so let me start telling you a little bit about uh, the paper that I shared for this live literature review, which is called We Too, Contending with the Sexual Politics of Fieldwork in China. This is a paper that I co-wrote with two colleagues, Jessica Wilsack and Elizabeth Lord. And I want to pause here to share that our colleague Elizabeth passed away in January. Um, she was too young, too brilliant, and had way too much more to say. Um, so I want to acknowledge and to honor her today talking about our paper and especially on this International Women's Day. Um, now, rather than summarize my paper, um, I want to tell how the paper came about and raise some points and some questions for broader discussion in this literature. Um, but maybe I will just very quickly summarize. The paper is uh, about our experiences of doing fieldwork in China um, and some of the experiences of other colleagues whom we discussed about their experiences with and uh, kind of told this story in a much more collective voice about the kinds of expectations we encountered, the gendered expectations, the sexual expectations, the gender-based forms of violence, and also how we navigated them. Um, but again, really, I'm just gonna talk about kind of how it came about and then I think some broader questions. So first to say how this paper came about is that it happened because the three of us, the three co-authors, we really found strength in a collective voice 
that we didn't feel individually for discussing these kind of issues. Um, so Elizabeth and I were at a conference together on uh, food and environmental politics in China, which is our, our research area. And after dinner, having drinks, we got onto the topic of field work and, you know, as this often happens, discussing the joys and the hoops and, you know, the challenges and how we dealt with things. And also very much discussing shared experiences of sexual harassment and sexual violence. Um, so, you know, in discussing how familiar these experiences were both for ourselves and for most of the women and many men that we spoke to who were our colleagues also doing field research in China, we were, you know, struck at both how common the experiences were and how fully hidden they were from any formal conversation, be it in print, uh, be it in conference discussions, um, just be it anywhere. And so we really reflected on that and how that made us feel really, um, you know, like we were alone in it, right? That we were the only ones having these experiences. He's presenting about. Sorry? Oh. <laughs> um, so um, after finishing my field work, which was in around 2011, I had actually written a prologue to my dissertation about the gender-based violence I'd experienced and was advised to keep it out of my dissertation by a well-meaning advisor who thought that including it in my dissertation would somehow kind of sully uh, my real work that if people read that part they would not take as seriously my other scholarship and so you know I followed that advice but this feeling of wanting to share these experiences but also wanting to reflect on how those experiences really shaped my project of course never went away um, they just kept coming up so with uh, talking to Elizabeth and Jess who had also thought about writing something on this topic but hadn't done so for similar fears of not being taken seriously or something. Um, we found that by working together uh, and by kind of including our own experiences and those of our colleagues, we found that this solidarity took away some of our fears, um, some of you know our trepidation about putting this in print in an incredibly kind of male dominated and masculinist field. And so my first point really is that I think solidarity is crucial in taking on this topic of gender-based violence in field work. Now, beyond what is kind of particular to fieldwork in China and, and, and our paper in general, um, which I'd really be happy to discuss if people are interested, I wanna raise three broader points about discussing, theorizing, and dealing with gender-based violence in fieldwork. And the first point is around this idea of the Me Too of privilege. Um, so in our paper, we struggled with how to write about experiencing sexual violence as privileged white North American women with generous fieldwork funding from governments and universities who fly kind of into the field, we observe, we ask questions, we develop relationships and then we fly out. And this is of course a more general concern in ethnographic research and a concern about kind of the extractive nature of what we do. But so our concerns with calling out sexual violence that happens when you are this researcher with these clear privileges, our concerns first, I think about how you situate yourself, right? How you situate your own privilege vis-a-vis -vis other forms of privilege and an inequality around class, race, gender, sexuality, um, disability, kind of all of these intersecting forms of inequality and oppression. And to think about those intersections, not only in field work, but also in terms of how we came to be researchers at elite universities doing this kind of funded research, right? So questions of who gets to speak and who speaks for who, for who and how that plays out in you know, the practice of our research and then also how we write about it. And this really doesn't get talked enough about. And I would say, especially in sort of international research where you know people are going to contexts that are not their own and um, working and writing. But the concern is also about how we situate the people enacting gender-based violence, right? So how do we discuss not only ourselves and our positions, but our positions vis-a-vis -vis the people who are groping us or harassing us or raping us in some cases, right? And how do we do that in a way from these positions of privilege that doesn't essentialize these people, that doesn't other them, that doesn't sort of add to or deepen stereotypes that exist 
Um, so how do we not make claims that all Chinese businessmen behave this way? Or for many people, especially white people who work in Africa, how do you, how would you discuss these issues without sort of adding to the over-sexualization of black men, which is really a problem. So just to say this Me Too of privilege, I think really importantly raises situating yourselves and the others. Um, so in our paper, we try to address these concerns by being clear about our positionalities um, and, and looking at times, so I'm gonna skip ahead of it, about our own positionalities, but we also really tried to situate the men, the per perpetrators of gender-based violence. And the way that we did that was trying to situate in the kind of political economic moment uh, in China today. So we discuss the changing place of women, especially Chinese women in Chinese society. We discuss the hyper-masculinization of Chinese men, the sexualization of women in the media, and the commodification of women's bodies that really underlies China's economic boom. And so, we discussed these in order to kind of situate these experiences that we had, and especially the ways in which we would feel our positionalities shifting in the course of research, going from, let's say, being, you know, um, a foreign um, invited scholar in one context to the shift that we felt when we were then in spaces of sex work. Um, where we felt our position shift to kind of being seen as just another woman in the room who might be for sale and might be for conquest. So the point I wanna make here really is that engaging this Me Too of privilege requires intersectionalities of ourselves as researchers and authors and of our fieldwork context. Um, the second point is that we must include men, our male colleagues especially in these discussions, both in our conversations and in writing. Um, the most, I think, basic point around that is that gender is not a women's issue. Um, gender typically falls to women to define, to bring into analyses, to unpack and to context because of oppressive gendered hierarchies. But gender is an everybody issue and patriarchy is harmful to us all. So we need to think about how men also encounter gendered expectations, maybe especially around sex and sexuality in the field, and how they navigate those expectations. And to be clear, there are massive gendered differences between threat and experience of gender-based violence, which is mostly suffered on and by women, but we need to include men because they also encounter what could be uncomfortable or traumatic situations in fieldwork around gendered issues. Um, we also need male colleagues to understand and to be in solidarity with us, especially when men continue to occupy most of the positions of power in our institutions. Um, and we need to sort of normalize these conversations um, and to also be in conversation with our male colleagues for taking up these issues in their own theorizing and their teaching and their advising around field work. Um, so gender-based violence is not a women's issue because that violence also involves perpetrators who are most of the time men. It involves men as witnesses or as allies in our ac academic institutions, which are still kind of largely headed by men and much research done by men, um, getting gender-based violence in field work on the agenda and in circulation really requires solidarity with and from our male colleagues. So the third, third and final point I wanna make is about this normalization and internalization of gender-based violence in field work. Um, so again, we wrote this paper that I shared today um, because we wanted to bring the conversations that we were having in the shadows for years into the light. And this was especially for people doing fieldwork in China, especially for early career researchers. And of course, many others are doing this in many other contexts. But there's so many questions that remain open about why we ourselves waited so long and why we found these experiences of gender-based violence so common among our female colleagues and yet so widely unacknowledged. So I think some key questions to ask are really why do we internalize getting groped or being asked for sex or feeling afraid when we're doing field work? Why do we internalize that as sort of normal? Why do we think it's part of what we signed up for when we decided to do field work and sort of accept it tacitly or otherwise? 
And I think part of the answer to this is in this trope of the heroic field worker, which we um, discussed in the paper, and the sanctions against those of us who sort of fail to kind of swoop into a place, immediately make, um, start developing mutual relationships, um, gain brilliant insights from those relationships, and then publish piles of papers and books. Um, and so in this context, I think we internalize these feelings because of the shame that we feel if you know something happened to us or the fear, again, of not being taken seriously if we publish about it or the fear of getting marked as, oh, you're the person who writes about gender-based violence and field work rather than, oh, you're the person who writes about the political economy of agricultural development in China, right? So all of these things, I think, play into our internalization. Um, and another part of that answer is that many of us have already internalized patriarchy and paternalism and gender-based violence in our daily lives. Many of us have endured sexual violence in our lives outside of field work. In some cases, sexual violence that's much more traumatic perhaps than what we experienced during field work. And so it seems relative in a way. So I think we need to understand this internalization of violence more deeply. And at the same time, we have to ask and attend to questions of what it means if we don't internalize and normalize sexism, paternalism, and intersectional forms of violence. So Tarana Burke and the Me Too movement have really given us this platform and a form of solidarity to share our experiences, to express our rejection of violence as normal and acceptable. So do we then have a responsibility to share our experiences? And do we have that responsibility to share in print with colleagues, with students, with our institutions? And what does this mean in terms of boundaries between what's private and personal and what's public? So what is ours and what is shared? And what feels like spectacle and sharing versus what feels like speaking truth to power? Also, how will and will that responsibility to take on these questions be valued? Is it work that we do on the side of our main research? Is it volunteer committee work inside of our universities and institutions? Is it care work that brings us more students in trouble than we can handle? How do we then think about and do our own field work if we decide we're not willing to be traumatized anymore? Do we have to give it up? Do we give up field work? Do we decide that certain topics are off limits because we know what will be expected of us in pursuing them? Does making gender-based violence more visible mean that we write about it in every manuscript that we write about our research? Do we talk about it in every conference presentation that we have? And what does that mean for us professionally when we haven't kind of yet broken these um, structures of, of expectation? And if we make these decisions for ourselves, and in our advising of students about where our boundaries are around engaging and sharing or not with gender-based violence. And if part of that decision includes certain topics being off limit or doing less field work, does that then reproduce gender divisions in who does what kind of research um, and who does what kind of teaching and advising about field work. So I just, I don't have an answer for those questions. I think they're important to put on the table, of course. Um, and so my final concluding remark is that for me, these questions of situating gender-based violence in field work are questions of situating that in much broader systems of oppression, that this is really key. And so in my view, we need to center patriarchal and intersectional violence inside and outside of the field and before, during, and after experiences of sexual trauma as researchers. And to do that, I think we have to attend to questions of who has responsibility to discuss and to unpack gender-based violence in field work? How is that responsibility shared and how is it unevenly expected? Who will do the labor of teaching, advising, caring, and theorizing about gender-based violence? And how will that be valued or not within our institutions, um, within our journals, within our collegial networks? Um, so I'll finish there saying again that these are not questions that I would like to offer answers as much as they're questions that I find are ones um, 
that continue to uh, scratch or itch <laughs> in looking for answers. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Mindy. That was killer. Um, super organized, really um, asked a lot of the questions that I think all of us need uh, are thinking about already and are experiencing and different things. Um, yeah, that was that was great. Um, uh, so like I said before, um, we will um, feel free to start writing questions in the chat if you have them. Um, you're getting all sorts of compliments on, on that being so good. <laughs> um, so yeah, feel free to start posting questions in the chat, um, but I will turn it over now to Erin to present her paper or to present whatever she'd like to talk about um, <laughs> that, that uh, is related to this topic. So just realized I was on mute. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, first of all, that was brilliant, Mindy. Um, really thought provoking. Um, and I probably do have questions, but I'll forget by the end of this. Uh, so yeah, so I'm just gonna build on some of what Mindy was talking about, but on my own specific experience um, of sexual assault when I was uh, recruiting participants. So back in 2009, I started a PhD at Newcastle University in the UK, um, and that was in human geography. Um, I am a geographer by uh, background. Um, and I was interested in understanding how people with dwarfism, or some people might know them as little people, I hate that term, sorry, um, or dwarfs, whatever, uh, how they experience public spaces, both socially and spatially. And so to recruit participants, I needed to attend associations for people with dwarfism because I wanted to do um, you know, uh, semi-structured interviews with people with dwarfism living in the UK. And I don't know any people with dwarfism personally, because one thing I often get asked is, oh, are your family dwarfs? And it's like, no, we don't come from a magical forest or anything, okay? It is just a condition, and like any other condition, it can be genetic. And, you know, I, I was just born with this very rare condition. Um, and because it's very rare, I've never sort of really met any people with dwarfism. So to recruit, I had to attend these associations. So I attended one, the most uh, popular one, which is the Restricted Growth Association in the UK. And I'm actually mentioning that now. It's the first time I've mentioned it, because if you'll notice in my paper, I don't mention the name and that's because of their um, reaction, which I will come on to. So I attended several events because I'm a woman with dwarfism. And that was great because I thought, right, here's my positionality. I've got this, um, you know, one up on other people who don't have dwarfism. Finally, it's shown an advantage. I can go and do my PhD research um, and ask questions that, you know, an average sized person wouldn't really know. And the thing is, as most of you know, with dwarfism, you see it everywhere, don't you? You don't see a person with dwarfism, but you see people with dwarfism on the telly, in films. There's a cultural fascination with us. People are obsessed with seeing dwarfs. You know, we were popular exhibits in the freak show. So a lot of the time, people with dwarfism refuse to be researched. They refuse to be questioned because they're sick and tired of people going, what's it like to be a dwarf? Well, I put mine as an emancipatory form of research where I said, I want to explore our experiences and put them on paper and make people aware of them. So I had this, you know, impact. So I went to a couple of events held by the Restricted Growth Association uh, back in 2010. So it's a while back now. And whilst I was there, I met some nice people, don't get me wrong, um, but it was quite a lot of cliques, you know? This was meant to be this fun, safe place for people with dwarfism. And as one of them points out, if I have it here, it was a place where, you know, these are full days because, you, you know, you go there over the weekend in which people with dwarfism and their families can attend a range of interactive workshops, informative talks and fun activities. New friendships can be forged and old ones rekindled over the special long weekend, which includes a festival themed party um, and then a disco and a gala dinner and fireworks display. So it's a very social place and that's great. OK, but the thing is, when you when you're a person with dwarfism, this is the only opportunity you get to be in a space where people aren't staring at you. People aren't taking photographs of you. People aren't shouting midget across the, uh, you know, 
a, a space. They aren't singing the Oompa Loompa song at you. So you finally like, wow, I found a space that I can be safe in. However, it also has that problematic the, the turn. It becomes a very unsafe space for women. And it becomes that typical space that a lot of women experience where, you know, you feel unsafe because people with dwarfism are often seen as, a, well, people who are disabled are often seen as asexual because of eugenics and everything. We're seen as people that, you know, don't have partners and stuff. And actually, I'd just broken up with my average size boyfriend at this point because I was moving away to Newcastle and stuff. But I went to this place as a woman just to recruit people with dwarfism, whereas it, there was a conflicting space. It was a conflicting meaning in this space, because for me, the meaning was recruitment. For a lot of men with dwarfism, the meaning is I'm going to find a partner. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't care. You can ask me on a date. I can be flattered. But if I say no, no means no. And I don't get how difficult and why we are still talking about that, you know? So there was a guy there um, that I got talking to, you know, talking about the project, like, and he asked me out, he said, will you be my date for the disco? And I was like, no, I'm just not interested. You know, that was the end of the matter, I thought. Anyway, it just carried on. There was a silent auction and there's a little auction. And um, I walked in on this auction where he was bidding for a Swarovski necklace. And I thought, well, that's not really going to suit him. And then it twigged. I thought, oh, no, he's trying to get that for me. So I start outbidding him. And then luckily, because I'm a poor PhD student, somebody outbids me. And he goes to me, oh, so why were you bidding on that? I was trying to win it for you. And I said, but we're not dating. I said, no, I told you no. And then he goes, what's in the bag? And I bought a dress because of the disco. <clears throat> Sorry. And, I, and he goes, well, I can come up to your room and watch you try it on. And I was like, no, 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 it's okay. You, I, I can put a dress on myself. Um, and you know, th this was the kind of thing. So I stayed away from him. Anyway, the gala dinner, you get seated next to people. I got seated next to him. So I was like, okay. So I was there and by this point, my key card had gone missing and I thought, okay, that's a bit strange, but I thought maybe it's me. I've dropped it somewhere. Anyway, I went to go and get coffee and he followed me, and that's when he sexually assaulted me. Now, I won't go into detail about what he did or anything, but obviously it left me a bit shaken. So I went back to my room. I stayed away from him, went to my room, and the next day, you know, I didn't even stop for breakfast. I, I just grabbed a coffee and checked out and just gave my key card, explained to the lady that one of my cards has gone missing. She was like, yeah, it's fine. But I went home, and I didn't really think about it you know, afterwards, I, I knew this wasn't right, but I thought, am I overreacting or something? And it's like what Mindy says, we, we process all these thoughts. Um, and I, I, in the end, I, I didn't mention it for ages, but there was another upcoming event, which I had to attend to, uh, you know, try and recruit more participants. But I was getting more nervous, more anxious about it. I was feeling so sick about thinking of going to this place. And so I told my PhD supervisors, I said, I don't want to go back. And I explained to one of them who was um, female, like, you know, no disrespect to the male one. I know he was very supportive, but in these times, you just feel so much safer. I, I don't know. I just felt she could understand it more. So I explained to her and she goes, okay, don't go. Um, but she says, you know, you should let the association know what's happened. And so I did, I emailed them and I didn't go into detail. I went into less detail than what I did here. I just said, look, I've been, I've had this unwanted, um, you know, attention. I've been sexually assaulted basically by this member. And the response I got was, oh, that doesn't happen here. Oh, we, we're not aware of any of that. You know, let's brush it under the carpet. Um, so I was like, okay. So I didn't go to any more events and I let it drop. Um, but unlike Mindy, my, my, my PhD supervisor says, when talking about recruitment in your methodology chapter and how you recruit it and why you've only then gone and recruited women, you need to, oh no, the post office man's coming, so sorry if my dog barks. Um, but he said, you need to state why you recruited only women in the end. And so I did. Um, and then when my PhD was published, the RGA had obviously looked through it and spent more time looking through my PhD 
and trying to find ways to blame me and make out that I was a liar. Um, you know, this is meant to be the space where dwarfs are, you know, looked after and supported. Um, so they said, you have no evidence of this. You have no evidence of that. There's conflicting evidence. And I was like, what's the conflicting evidence? And they couldn't tell me the conflicting evidence. So I found out because I was um, interviewing one uh, woman with dwarfism and she goes, are you going to the upcoming event? And I went, no. And she goes, why not? And I go, and I explained and she goes, yeah, um, I had to tell that guy to behave himself, but we're now dating. It turns out they were both on the committee as well for the RGA. So I wasn't, was I? So what chance did I have? So um, I was threatened with all this legal action, but so I thought I'm not gonna stay silent. So I put it on Facebook on one of the um, groups for people with dwarfism, I put it on a few. I got so much support from women and I actually got support from a few men with dwarfism because I said, I know it's not all men with dwarfism, but this is something that's going on at these events. Can we nip it in the bud? That's all I wanted the organization to do. I didn't want to lynch them. I didn't want to go out with pitchforks. I just wanted them to be aware of it and put in procedures and things to sort of say, this is how we run now and we're not going to tolerate that kind of behavior. So I had a few women give me their um, stories as well, because I thought, you know, safety in numbers. So this is from one woman, I'll read it out. I was at a convention and I was in so much pain due to my arthritis that I took some strong painkillers and went to bed early. I was woken up by a constant banging on my hotel door. When I answered it, there was a man with dwarfism standing there with a bottle of champagne and two glasses wanting to come in. This is the thing, it's at a hotel. So he was just banging up this door wanting to come into her room, like the man who wanted to try, you know, come in to see when I was trying on the dress. I had another woman who was also doing a PhD and she goes, I had a participant and this again, both had dwarfism. I had a participant try and change the dynamic of what I was requesting by proposing that he take me out to do the interview. Um, it made me very uncomfortable that he took my initiative to meet a social researcher and potential participant and frame it as a date. And it felt very much that he wanted to have the upper hand on what was occurring between us. In the end, I had to block him from social media as it is clear that his interest in me would prevent him participating in my project. So that's just two, I had others. But I put this on Facebook, other women have put it on Facebook because we just want to have these discussions. Um, yet when I put it on the RGA's Facebook group, I again got the abuse and actually got banned from there. You know, I actually had one man who was described as a creep by several women, women because you would come on to them. He'd said, Erin, there would have been a time that I would have taken you out and I would have acted like the perfect gentleman, but I won't be taking you out now. I'm like, you wouldn't have taken me out in the first place, mate, because I would have said no to you. This is what you're not getting. You don't respond well to the word no. You know, he said, well, you're going to frighten all the men away. And I'm like, I don't care. Why do you th think that I'm just interested in dating a man with dwarfism? Now, they got a new chair and he said, oh, I didn't know you'd been through this. So I explained to him and he said, oh, yeah, this conflict in interest and, and evidence. And I said, well, what is it? And he never got back to me. This is a man who advocates himself as this massive advocate of dwarfism. People follow him on Twitter because he's so good in raising awareness about dwarfism. Yet again, he tried to hide all this under the carpet. And this is the problem. You know, these safe spaces, like look at the charities. I only felt safe talking about it because of me too. Because I felt finally it was, you know, there was lots of cases. I can't be disbelieved, you know? So then my best friend, who is also a researcher at Sussex University said, I'm putting together an edited book, Erin. Can you write a chapter on what happened to you? I said, no, I'll get threatened with legal action again. She goes, no, I'll make sure that the publishers and all that will have your back. So I said, okay. So I just took out the name of the association and it was published. But when my professor, who is like a research mentor to me was looking over it now back at Liverpool Hope, he said, Erin, Erin, this is more than a chapter. You need to turn this into an article. Finally, I felt I was being believed. And then he said, will you be on the plenary um, session for the, you know, the, conf uh, the conference that's coming up for CCDS? I said, yeah. It finally gave me that thing that I was being believed that I wasn't being disbelieved, that I wasn't a liar, that I didn't have to think to myself, did that actually happen? No, I knew it happened. I knew what he did. I know I felt it, you know? And so 
I'm now saying we need to start talking and diversifying because this is bringing the disabled voice into it. It's specifically, it's bringing the people with dwarfism who often get, you know, who are seen as a joke by wider society, who are seen as asexual because, you know, we have people like Chelsea Handler, the Z-list presenter saying, I want to sleep with a dwarf because that would be child abuse. Yeah, and it's like, honey, unless they're under 18, it's not child abuse. You know, so we need to start looking at that because until we start seeing people who are disabled or people with dwarfism as sexual and, you know, capable and of these things and capable, if they're, if they're sexual and then they're capable of sexual abuse, then we need to start having these conversations and taking it more seriously. Now, as a researcher, I had to write in my paper, as you'll see if you read it, recommendations on what we should do. And of course, it should be like, you know, do paired interviews or take someone with you when you do an interview, because a lot of the time you've got to interview in the home and stuff. And of course, you know, you're trying to resolve these power relations. But when you lower the power relations, that means you are more vulnerable. And then I thought to myself, why should I be having to look at ways to protect me? What can universities, what can you know, research institutions do to make these uh, research safer for women or for anybody, um, you know, when it comes to sexual abuse. I mean, I've got dissertation students, masters, um, you know, ed D and all that, as well as just undergraduates who go off and they go, I'm going to go and interview a load of teachers. And I'm like, okay, we never talk about how some of my female students who are in the early 20s um, might be put at risk going interviewing a lone teacher in his office. We don't think about that. And I'd seen daft for pointing it out because there's nothing in any of these ethical statements um, that that's say we should think about sexual assault or possibilities of it. So yeah, so that's me. Um, I think that's about good timing actually. So thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. I, I, I recognize that it takes a, a particular type of willingness to be vulnerable and a particular type of strength to be able to navigate that that whole horrible situation that you had to navigate. Um, and then to be able to process it and do things about it and speak about it and now write about it and now speak to us about it. it it's, um, it's really inspiring um, and also just really infuriating and it's horrible that you had to go through that. So thank you very much for being willing to talk about it here and in so many other um, places and words and things. Well, okay, so um, I'm going to um, just talk about a couple things that I found were were common between um, the two presentations and two articles, um, and then open it up to a wider discussion. Um, so one of the things um, is uh, this idea of hearing the same story um, behind closed, hearing the same story from people behind closed doors, but then not seeing it in any any kind of public sphere in um, in writing um, or uh, or seeing it misrepresented, like Erin was saying, when you're watching TV and the representation um, of um, disabled people or people with dwarfism or whatever it might be. Um, so I, I think um, this issue around what we talk about with our friends and our colleagues versus what we present um, in our professional shoes and hats um, and the gulf between those things is, is a worthwhile thing to be exploring a bit. Um, another thing that seemed uh, that was interesting is um, if you're not specifically researching gender or sex or disability or race or other types of identity, identities, but then you are necessarily being them. You're embodied, you're embodying a gendered, sexualized, disabled, racialized, or whatever body in the world. Um, so the, you know, what happens if you're embodying those things, but not necessarily researching those things. Um, so maybe you haven't spent a lot of time or energy reading about or thinking about um, those issues in kind of an academic sense before you encounter them in data collection. Um, so I think that's kind of another theme that's worth exploring a bit. Um, then the issue of recognizing and accounting for the power of the privileges you have, but then still experiencing powerlessness and vulnerability and oppression in your work. Um, and then, um, yeah, so then I think both of these articles and, and others um, on these topics talk about fieldwork as something that 
reinforcing that, that reinforces existing power structures, um, which makes it difficult for work to get done. It makes it difficult for a broad awareness of these things to take root, and then for these difficult difficulties to be ultimately mitigated and redressed. So I think a question is how are we? How do we tell these stories? Um, so Mindy and her co-authors opted to attribute all quotations in their work to contributors um, who included the 12 colleagues who participated in their work as well as themselves. And then Erin used autoethnography and openly writes and, and speaks in first person about her experiences. Um, but really, should we have to make ourselves vulnerable um, to get people to do something about the things that we experience? Um, what sorts of actions could help to dismantle the obstacles in place to resolving these issues and who has the ability and the responsibility to undertake them. And then finally, I think, what would emancipatory fieldwork look like? Um, and how do we prevent and mitigate the, the backlash that often follows um, when, when you start to um, pick away at <clears throat> or challenge established power structures? Um, so I'll, I'll start with kind of those, I don't know, general provocations and things that I recognize as common themes between the two pieces of work. Um, and I will open it up to all of you. Um, it would be helpful uh, if, if you want to raise your hand um, and then we, I can call on you um, and you can, you, can ask the, you can ask your question. Or if you pr would prefer not to do that, feel free to drop it in the chat and we can raise it that way. Um, I'll start, I guess, with Alicia, um, who asked a question earlier. Alicia, do you want to ask it? Um, do you want to unmute yourself and ask it? Okay, unmuting is impossible. Okay, um, I'll I'll read your question. Um, so I'm, it, now I'm I'm sorry because you just made me now um, <laughs> like unmuted. So now I can ask it. Myself. Okay, good. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thank you both for um, for your presentations. Uh, I think they were really great, and it's very interesting how um, how we actually keep talking about uh, similar problems and similar things. Uh, we have similar issues and postulates. So I guess uh, we are already able to map all those things that are that we experience and also which are necessary to um, somehow make the situation better. But I was uh, going to ask uh, Mindy about including men into writing and discussion at, uh, about sexual harassment in the field as you um, as you stated that it's necessary and I do definitely I do understand that but I was wondering um, what did you mean exactly did you mean reaching out to those men uh, or other people who experience um, sexual harassment in the field and include those people or to somehow uh, build a discussion with well all academic fields and participants of uh, academic fields um, overall uh, and somehow uh, build this discussion with people without this experience and men, men without this experience. So I was wondering how to do that exactly. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I think what I mean is um, both in short. Uh, first, I would say, when I say we need to include men, um, I mean it also in the way that we discuss and theorize about gender, right? Which, like I said, that gender is not a women's issue. It often falls on women to take responsibility for, to bring into conversations, but um, it's not just a women's issue, right? So in our paper, we also wanted to discuss with our male colleagues the kinds of um, I mean, in the case of what we were talking about and working on, the kinds of sexualized and sexual expectations that they encountered when they were doing their field work, 
um, and also how they navigated those. And we actually have a, a colleague who's written about this in print, a male colleague who's written a little bit about this in print, um, and other male colleagues who, yeah, they felt really traumatized by their field work, actually, by the expectations that they would necessarily sort of engage in um, sex work, that they would kind of necessarily um, you know, be or perform these kind of men who hang out in KTVs and pay women for sex, right? And they felt really quite a lot of pressure to be and to perform that way. And that was also something they really needed to navigate. So from that perspective, I think also including kind of men's experiences of gendered expectations is important. But maybe more practically kind of in our institutions, um, I think it's important, you know, again, that we don't see this as just a, an issue and a responsibility for women, because all of us are engaged in teaching field research methods or in advising students who are doing field research and writing about our field research, whether it's just writing ethnographies or actually writing about this, this situation head on. Um, and I think, you know, there are plenty of men who teach research methods courses and this issue needs to be brought up in those courses, right? Um, and I think especially it can be even, I don't think this is necessarily an easy topic for anyone to take on in our teaching and researching. I think it could be even, in some cases, especially difficult for men because, well, there's a lot of things to, um, how do I mean to say this, to kind of trip over, right? I mean, it can be an uncomfortable thing to talk about as a woman and also as a man. So what I'm saying is just that I want to normalize these conversations um, among both men and women and really kind of have these conversations in our, in our teaching and advising. And that can't just be the responsibility of women. Yeah, totally. Excellent, excellent answer. Um, I was in the process of um, putting into the chat an article by um, a guy named Adam Baird at Coventry, um, who talks about his experience of researching um, young men in gangs in Medellin. And he reflects on his own experience being a man and what that did sort of to his, his field work and his access and all these different issues. Um, this is clearly this is something that is coming up um, in the chat. Um, so uh, Ellen wrote to me earlier saying that she's in the middle of stuff. So I'll, I'll read her comment. Um, this is uh, Ellen Van Damme. Um, she says, thank you very much, Mindy and Erin. I study women and gangs in Central America. I think indeed that we should be more reflective on why we focus on women in our research to avoid harassment, etc. Also, I'm repeatedly told to leave out sexual harassment issues in articles that do not have sexual harassment in field research as its main topic. But I support the idea, <clears throat> excuse me, that we should raise this issue every time we can so that future researchers are very aware of this and no longer scared to discuss this openly. It would also help male supervisors to become more aware of this issue. Um, yeah, that, that seems like a, a solid recommendation. Um, I don't know, Mindy or Erin, if, if either of you have um, anything to say about that or um, I can keep adding stuff. Um, can I just yeah, add sure. that I completely agree. Um, my colleague and I just put out, um, we put out a call for an edited collection on sexual misconduct uh, in academia. And we were expecting, you know, we put it out to both men and women, um, but we had no contributions for men. It was just women. Now, of course, you can put that down that there's more cases towards women. But also we did have one person um, who we know who was a man and he spoke to us about his experience, but says, you know, I don't want to contribute. Now we haven't really probed into that reason. We'd have loved him to have contributed, even though it's on a horrible topic, but it's a case of, there's so many things. I think it's still the patriarchal system where you're admitting vulnerability. And as a man, that's even worse than a woman sort of thing, isn't it? Because then you, you're seen as kind of weak. Why didn't you fight back and all this? So it's also those patriarchal structures that can hold them back. And I think those are what we've got to unpick first. Um, because I do think it's an important thing, you know, but I then I don't want to shy away from the fact that it is mostly impacting women. women. Um, and that's, you know, so whoever comes forward should be 
speaking about it. And then on her second point, which I think is good, you, you know, you're kind of told not to talk about it. And I remember that in one case during my PhD, but then I thought, you know what, now it's quite cathartic to talk about it. And I was not made, I wasn't, I've never been forced, but like I said, my best friend and then my research mentor, who's also a close friend, actually encouraged me. And I think that's what we need to be doing is that encouragement instead of saying, no, you can't talk about it, encourage people to come forward and encourage them to talk about it in the right way, you know, have those sort of structures to do it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Erin. Um, so uh, I'm seeing comments from Gemma uh, Vanderhart and from Victoria. Um, do you both want to, um, to jump in and talk about the things that you're mentioning in the chat? I think Gemma has had to leave. Uh, she's a colleague of mine and she wrote a message saying she had another meeting to go to. Okay. Great. Um, so she says, men might also be vulnerable in the field while they are expected by society and by peers to be less concerned with their safety. It would enrich the conversation to include these experiences. Yeah, <laughs> truth. Um, I'm also noticing, um, you know, in, in, in this room, uh, I, I can't for sure tell, but it seems like there's definitely more women here than there are men um, who are kind of attracted to come to this conversation. Um, so it's sort of, uh, and I've been chatting with a colleague of mine um, at the development planning unit um, who was here briefly but had to go and he was saying that he wants to know about future events because he wants to be constantly reminded of this issue, <laughs> um, which seemed like uh, a useful way of thinking about it. Um, Victoria, I don't know if you're still here. Oh yeah, I, I see that you're still here, but feel free to ask your, to talk about what you were saying. Hi, yes, thank you. Firstly, um, thank you very, very much, um, both Mindy and Erin, for your talks today. They have been really, really insightful. And thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us. Um, my question is more about the ethics and the ethical processes of this conversation, not least because, or not necessarily about the organizations in question, but more yourselves personally, um, and the processes that you may have navigated, the ethical challenges that you may have navigated in, in discussing these concepts and this, these experiences. Obviously, as researchers, we need to be considerate of our participants, but we also need to be considerate of ourselves. So yeah, I just wondered if there were any ethical considerations you'd process and how you navigated those. Erin and Mindy, feel free to jump in. Um, yeah, Erin, do you want to go ahead? No, you, you can, if you'd like. Yeah, um, the ethical considerations, I think, you know, that I was thinking were mostly just the standard ethical considerations that we have about protecting the anonymity of, you know, the, the, the people and the places where, um, you know, I was talking about these, these forms of violence that happened. Um, which I think was different for Aaron in the way that you were able to or not kind of protect that anonymity and whether that was something you even thought was a necessary good or just thing to do, right? Um, yeah, so that was the, I think that was the main eth ethical issue that, that I encountered was, you know, about protecting people, your research participants or people that you engage with doing research. Yeah, um, yeah, it's very similar. Um, you know, there's obviously all that, it's, it's basic ethics, isn't it? Anonymity and confidentiality. So you provide anonymity to all your participants and stuff. Now for me, um, I provided anonymity later to the association just because they threatened me to. Um, but yeah, I felt, why should I with them? they should be held account of what they've done, what they allowed to happen. Uh, I actually reported them to the Charities Commission and that was investigated, but you don't get feedback from that. Um, you know, in terms of the participants I used, because it was autoethnography, so obviously <laughs> there's no anonymity there, but I also did in, um, took extracts from women that spoke to me about their own experiences and obviously kept those 
as you know anonymized as I could um, because people with dwarfism it's quite a close-knit community in terms of the association so everyone knows each other um, so I think it's important there but then I think it's also important to speak out and then you know you've just got the normal sort of things but I think in terms of ethics we need more ethics to look at how these issues are resolved but I, I'm not sure about that yet this is um, Kamud had a, a comment and um, if you want to unmute yourself and talk about it, because I think it's connected with this idea of um, kind of the processes and protocols and institutionalized approach to, to these issues. Thanks, Erin and Mindy for your presentations. I really um, felt for Erin because because of all of what we've experienced and the silence and also the disbelief which often happens to us who speak against these things. But I'm also working on a policy against harassment for, uh, for an association like the one that you mentioned. And I was wondering if, um, if you were aware or anyone else in the group is aware of um, the requirements for such organizations to have a redress mechanism in place by the law and whether that even helps in any way um, because because we often have to deal with older male colleagues in these associations who have no experience of such harassment. So they will often say what you just said, Erin, like we, such things don't happen here. And they've told me that as well. And I've had to tell them it did happen in this event. I just can't say who it happened to. Um, but you constantly face this uh, resistance against, you know, um, specific things within the policy which they think is too much. Um, and you constantly have to expend a lot of your emotional and intellectual energy into making them understand why things are important. So I just want to um, wanted to ask about what is required by law and if and then the, and the loopholes that they might um, uh, be able to exploit even if something is in in the law. Okay, um, I think. I, I don't know what the laws are specifically. I know um, one charity that, you know, the basic is they, they take statements from both you and the perpetrator. Um, that's what's meant to happen. And then they can look through them and see and come and talk and go to the committee about it. However, that never happened. Um, they never took statements off me. They were just like, oh, it doesn't happen here. That's it, you know? Um, so, I, I don't know. I mean, that's why I reported it to the Charities Commission. That was the next step. But of course, you don't get an outcome of that. You're not entitled to know the outcome. So I don't know what happened with the outcome. Again, it's just so many silences. This is the whole thing with sexual assault. It's just silence, isn't it? You're not allowed to speak out about it. It remains this taboo subject. And this is why it just, just keeps happening. I never realized it was that bad until, well, look at us now. We're all talking about it here. Um, and like, you know, this book I'm putting together, we've had so many, um, you know, uh, abstracts come in, proposals, that it's actually quite rife in academia, it's quite rife in charities, it, we, we only knew about it a few years ago after, you know, the Oxfam scandal. Um, and, and it's because we're expected just to stay silent about it. And there is so much energy, like you say, in reporting and stuff, um, that you know knowing now there's so many other women that it's occurred to and happened to they just seem just to get ignored completely when it happens to them and I think with disabled charities they can hide behind that notion that well disabled people are asexual aren't they so we don't do anything like that everybody just comes in and has fun together so you know that's what I wanted them to do I just wanted them to put in some sort of policy some sort of thing in regulation to say, look, we will not tolerate this. If we see anything like this happening, we will just get rid of you. But it just seems that there's nothing there for that to occur. I think what's also important here is that, um, you know, we sort of have different institutions, right? We might have organizations that we're working with or within or around, but we also have our universities, which is also an organization that has sort of legal um, um, duties and human resources, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, guidelines. And so I think that I've seen some people trying to 
take this issue up within universities as an HR issue to extend the protections that we have as employees of a university when we're in the university to protections of us that we would have when we were in the field and doing field work. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of one, I think, dimension of action on this issue. But I've also, in another conversation um, about this sometime last year, someone was sharing that this can also become risky because universities being, you know, risk averse and kind of operating more and more like corporations these days, if too big of an issue, I don't mean to say too, if, you know, this issue is really brought to full attention, it can easily be the decision that, well, there's no more field work or, you know, maybe women can't do field work or something like this, where the risk becomes perceived as too big for the university to want to take responsibility for managing. And then we start to see things getting shut down. So I think exactly this kind of legal and institutional issue is um, super tricky. <laughs> and how it, universities intervene in it is really unclear at the moment. Yeah, I, I've... Um... I've had I've worked on things related to trauma while doing research on violence, and I had um, not necessarily related to sexual violence or gender-based violence, but kind of in general. And um, I luckily I've I've had you know really positive experiences at school from um, the people who I'm working with. But then I also had at some point a senior scholar tell me like I'm kind of talking about this and explaining why I was interested in this topic and saying you know I had experiences with this personally, and the person was like. Oh, that's interesting. I've never had that experience myself. I'm not sure why you would have had that. And I was like, all right, <laughs> um, that's fine. Um, and you know, how do you sort of break through that? I guess um, how, you know to talk about the a legal requirement would would be great. Um, although what Erin was saying that she you know you went through all the channels, you reported all the things, and then you have no idea what happened. It just sort of disappeared into into the world, into you know this black hole of this institution. Um, so that's not, it, it doesn't do very much for accountability um, and for redress in different ways. Um, it, it doesn't actually solve these problems and it doesn't create awareness about them. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna um, read uh, Leah's comment because she says that uh, she can't use her microphone so she can't ask herself. Um, but she asks, um, what are your thoughts on navigating this issue in terms of involving men in the dialogue and in terms of the role of men who have normalized sexual assault on women, um, who have engaged in this behavior or harassment? I wonder because the ideas around responsibility and consent have shifted and the Me Too movement has made people reflect on this and how women in many societies have been expected to dress a certain way or act a certain way to protect themselves which carries the implication of male powerlessness or lack of responsibility for their own actions. Of course, there are men with a history of inappropriate behavior and who are in positions of power, and academia is likely to be no exception. Um, how do we navigate this issue? And also, I'm gonna add to that um, my own question. <laughs> um, how do we kind of navigate our, I've, I've personally felt the kind of shame about that. Um, feeling like, okay, I'm going to this place, so I'm gonna dress in a certain way to not attract attention, and then being like, damn it, I don't wanna be doing that. I wanna dress however I wanna dress because I, I am here and I wanna be comfortable and it's hot outside or whatever it might be. Um, so, and then being angry um, and having to kind of navigate that anger and also navigate all this other stuff. So um, yeah, I'll turn it over back to you again. Um, yeah, I can just briefly come in on that. I mean, what you said then about the dress codes and that's a big thing, isn't it? If you get sexually assaulted they want to know what clothes you're wearing if you know if you were showing off your ankles or something um now i was quite i was quite scared when i mentioned to you lot that i actually went out and bought a dress for that disco that night in case people thought oh what she bought a dress while well, she was asking for it i'm not saying people would think like that but that's the general rule isn't it i didn't buy that for anybody but myself i bought that because i wanted to look nice you know um, but it wasn't for the male attention or anything. It was just so I could feel good in myself and relax because I'd been working hard. But there's definitely these power dynamics. And I worry, I want to involve men in these conversations, but I think it has to be the right men because a lot of men, there's too much power. And like, I when I shared it on certain groups, like I said, I did get support of some men and they were like, how can we support you? But these aren't the men that are the problem. 
The men that are the problem are the ones that try and still silence you, like the creep. And that's what I'm going to call him. Okay, he was the one who was like, you're going to scare all the men away. And then I had women messaging me, private messaging saying, oh, he gives me the creeps. He tried to think that he could date me because my daughter's a dwarf and so that he had a chance for me because this was a woman of average stature. And other people would say that and it just got that. Then he got all this support and I got banned from the site, you know, the group. So I think if we want to involve women, uh, men, which I think is a good thing in a lot of ways, we have to be prepared to sort of provide those structures first to say how we are going to let them in to talk about this and be supportive and not another barrier. Yeah, I think this question really gets at the heart of the, um, one of the points I was trying to make that this gender-based violence in field work is, part of much broader systems of oppression. And this is really the question, right? I mean, these are these are experiences that we have while doing our work. They're also experiences that we have not doing our work. Also, our experiences in our work are situated in broader kind of social relations that are largely paternal, patriarchal, um, misogynist, racist, colonial, right? So when we talk about gender-based violence in field work, we're talking about it in particular, and we also necessarily have to talk about these larger relations and systems of oppression, right? So um, when I say we have to involve men, yeah, it's a good point, maybe, you know, and define the terms by which we want to have those conversations. Um, it's also really clear, I mean, in my university and others, it's very common for um, you know, students, let's say students who are doing master's field research. I hear this anecdote over and over that they've experienced some sort of sexual violence and they feel that they can't talk to their supervisor about it. Most of their supervisors are male um, or that they do and they get sort of shuffled off, right? Like, well, maybe you're imagining that or yeah, that's never happened to me. Oh, that couldn't happen. I know these people, right? So I think definitely these dismissals happen also very much in our universities and among our colleagues, which I think is, you know, why it's so important again to normalize this conversation. Um, and well, this is also the question of that responsibility of whose responsibility is it to share and someone wrote about this in the comments do you also sort of traumatize or re-traumatize yourself every time you share this and I don't know Aaron how you feel about that if you feel sort of re-traumatized but I mean one idea is that maybe if we talk about it more in print and elsewhere maybe it becomes just completely indefensible for anyone to ever say to a student or someone else that can't happen that doesn't happen here because then we have a stack of papers to say well it does in fact I'm not sure so um yeah just to say men need to be part of the conversation but it's a conversation about something much broader than the university and field work <laughs> Yeah, it is, uh, I have a lot of feelings listening to both of your responses and also looking at all of the comments and questions in the chat. <laughs> um, Colin, before he left, mentioned um, uh, about the field. So he said it's not a special detached place where the field starts and stops um, and that there are many fields. And um, to, yeah, the, what you were saying, Mindy, that this is a much larger issue than, than academia and the academy. Um, so this, uh, he says, in other words, field workspaces should be part of the currently internal university campaigns against gender-based violence, even if it's not seen that way now. Because um, if you, you know, I think the point is if you're experiencing gender-based violence in your field and then you like, what does it mean to then take that back with you? Um, and how, how does that experience kind of follow you? Um, there's interesting, there's some interesting literature about uh, trauma being contagious. Um, across space and across time. And I, I think that that could be kind of an interesting thing to, to reflect on in that question. Um, let's see. Uh, Leah also asked, um, 
she's she is asking about power dynamics. Um, so she says, because we have data now that shows sexual assault isn't about desire for sexual contact, it's about power. Um, so this issue around um, disabled people um, or people with dwarfism not being sexual is not only challenging because it's infantilizing, but also because it overlooks the role of power. Um, so how can awareness of that be tackled? How can that issue be managed in this context, given the power dynamic of researchers and potential or actual participants? Who says up for me? Um, yeah, um, this is a difficult one because in disability research, because of the way it's formed, it comes from feminist research, you're meant to um, minimize those power dynamics because disabled people, voices are often silenced, but you're also meant to use or have disabled researchers. So you've got disabled people interviewing disabled people basically, and you're meant to have like limited power. Now that's problematic when it's men and women. And what I found, and what I found with a lot of uh, male dwarfs, and, and it's something that's pointed out in the question, is it is this power thing, isn't it? Now, I was going in as a PhD candidate interviewing some men. And I've had men afterwards sort of mansplaining my work to me. And I had one man with dwarfism saying, I've read everything on dwarfism. And I go, so you've read my, my papers and you've read my book, have you? And that kind of shut him up. Um, and, and this is the thing, like what I said about one of my, my one of my participants, one of the women who said that she was a PhD researcher, but you had this man trying to change the dynamics of her research. And, you know, you would never do that. You'd never dream. I would never, if someone was interviewing me just for whatever reason, like I was helping with their research. Yes, I'd want it at a time and place convenient for me, but I would never try and change someone's research. And this is what happened. So I think it is, there's a lot of that there. And because they're, disabled people and dwarfs are seen as asexual then we can ignore that and we can ignore that there's a power structure between men with dwarfism and women with dwarfism and then that's even more problematic because it, you just not get into the core of it you're not getting to those reasons so i think it's a really interesting um comment there from leah to say that we need to look at this power dynamics i'm going to claim the last question <laughs> Um, and, and also I'll, I'll add um, Sarah Dulilianos um, commented in the chat saying, speaking of re-traumatizing, I've been remembering throughout the talk certain moments of my latest field work, but I feel uplifted by seeing us all here and grateful to be able to hear Aaron and Mindy's stories. Thank you all so much for organizing and participating in this. So sort of related to that. Um, I know Aaron, you talked about wanting to do field work in an emancipatory way. Um, and Mindy, you were talking about, um, you know, the, the ways that uh, if universities or research bodies perceive that there's too much risk, then they sort of, there's a, a risk that they could then just shut this work down. Um, so I'm interested in from both of you about how to sort of claim this um, on our own terms as people who are doing this work um, to find emancipation liberation in this. Um, and like I said, to do it on our own terms. It doesn't need to be a complete answer. It can also be, I have more questions about this. That's okay too. I recognize it's a big question. I kind of changed the way I did the research. So um, I cut men out, um, but also I did telephone interviews and now I would do Zoom interviews, especially with COVID anyway. But um, that sort of gives you that divide between people. And if someone's getting a bit, you know, unwanted, you just switch them off, don't you? Um, so I think that's the way I would kind of do it um and have my own ways like I had um I, I bought you know a cheap mobile phone to to do some of my interviews and stuff and communicate with participants because I did have one male participant because I only had like one male interview um and he was I remember coming back from this interview in Manchester and I had loads of text messages off him and I said sorry I had um, a, a thing in Manchester and he goes who was the interview with and I said well I can't tell you that confidentiality and he goes was it with another man and I'm like no it wasn't but that doesn't matter anyway it doesn't matter who I interview it's got nothing to do with you but again he was trying to frame this that I'd interviewed him so I was dating him I'd interviewed 22 women I wasn't interested in dating them do you know what I mean this was a PhD not uh you know 
a social get together sort of thing. So I think it's about us putting it on our own terms and being on that table about research now and trying to change those research dynamics and saying what works for us and what makes safe for us and trying to say that you know research needs to take more account of the researcher safety so getting into those um, research ethical guidelines like here it's um you know the economic social research council and having more women on the table and saying how we can make research fit for us and work for us yeah um i think that's a brilliant answer erin um and i also see it a bit complicated in my case because, um, well, so we wrote in our paper about also these kinds of methods of uh, focusing on interviewing women and, you know, kind of distanced interviews and these kinds of things. And where I find that it brings a challenge for myself is that I wonder if it does kind of reproduce these divisions in who gets to do what kind of research because I was really trying to kind of do this ethnography in the halls of power in agribusiness in China which are mostly headed by men right so while I could sort of switch to interviewing some women there just simply weren't very many women who were in positions of power in you know this um this milieu so that became a bit difficult um and it also brings questions of thinking about the kind of research that i would be comfortable with or feel emancipated in i'm not sure that that's compatible with the kind of research that i've tried to do <laughs> in the sense that it just feels that um being in these situations where you feel a bit scared or you feel vulnerable or you indeed are some sort of object of of conquer to be conquered um they just seem to go along with the kind of research topics that have been the heart of my interest so i just am saying this to say that i find this such a confounding question and i still don't know how to how to navigate it um and I would also say that I think in many cases, there's a reason we see more of certain kinds of work done by men. <laughs> and I'm thinking of, you know, in my field, especially in China studies, we see a lot more kind of ethnographic and, and, and this kind of work done by men. And I don't know, but I wonder if in part is because women, we just get really tired of, of the energy and the trauma and the recovery that comes with trying to do this kind of field research. So for me, this question of emancipation is very much an open one. And um, yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> I'll, I'll wrap up the discussion here. Um, but before I turn it over to Anna, one of my co-organizers and a founder of the network, um, I wanted to uh, talk again very briefly about the bibliography that we've been putting together. Um, I'm dropping a link in the chat right now. So um, we've been putting together um, a bibliography that is public um, about these topics. Um, and it's an ongoing process. Uh, if anybody can look at it, like I said, it's open. Um, but if you would like to contribute to it, um, you can request uh, an invite through, um, through the page that I just linked, or you can email me. Um, I'll drop my email again in, in, the, in the chat. Um, Ideally, we'd like to continue to build this and continue to evolve this um, to be able to better document um, the scope of the problem, to be, able to, to be able to better understand some of the ways that we can support each other um, and heal each other and fortify each other. Um, and, and then ultimately to be able to make this not be an issue anymore. Um, so um, yeah, so I, I hope that all of you um, are interested. Well, obviously you're interested, you're here, but I hope that you're able to contribute to the bibliography. Um, you can feel free to email me or any of the organizers if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, and I'll turn it over to Anna to wrap up. I don't know if you can see my screen now. Uh, I just would like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, a big thank you to Ariana for sharing beautifully during this session. And of course, uh, to our presenters, uh, Mindy and Erin, for sharing their papers, their work, and their experiences. We, we really appreciate it. 
And we are also grateful to Queen Mary um, University of London for helping us uh, with the IT and facilitating the Zoom account with us. And we would like to invite you to the next uh, session, which is in June. Um, we will have two presenters, uh, Dr. Kumud Rana. I, she's here today with us. So she will present uh, two papers exploring homophobia and queer visibility in the field and gender, race, and violence in the field. And also we will have uh, the presentation of Dr. Helen Van Dam, and she will um, present a, a work in progress. So um, I think that's all for today. I don't know, Ariana, if you want to say something because I saw like a hand. No, no, it's fine. Okay, so thank you very much again. Um, and we hope to see you in June for the next session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we don't have um, a link to for the, the next presentation, the next session yet. Um, we'll finalize the organization of it in the next like probably a month or six weeks or so before the next one. So all of that information will be will be sent out then. Pues sí. <laughs> ah, voy a parar la grabación. Espera. Ah, no. Eh, stop recording. Okay.